This is the Build Wealth Canada podcast, episode number 97. Welcome to the Build Wealth Canada podcast, where it's all about becoming debt-free, accelerating your wealth, and taking control of your money. Now, here's your host, Cornell Schreiber. Hey, it's Cornell, and welcome to the Build Wealth Canada show. Today, we have a case study of someone that was actually able to pull off an early retirement. So we get to learn how they did it and apply those lessons to our own life. And he also wrote a book that I personally consider life-changing, in particular, when it comes to financial independence, early retirement, and achieving happiness. His name is Jordan Grummet, and his book is called Taking Stock, a hospice doctor's advice on financial independence, building wealth, and living a regret-free life. I highly recommend you check out the book. I wish I had it when I first set out on my financial independence journey, and I've also found it helpful in designing the lifestyle that we want in this semi-retired life stage that we're in right now. It's not only available as a regular book, but also as an audiobook over at Audible. In addition to the book, in this interview, we also cover how Jordan was able to achieve financial independence at such an early age, how he figured out whether he had enough to retire, how he ensures that he's withdrawing a sustainable amount from his investment portfolio and not depleting it prematurely in retirement, and tips on how you can reach your financial independence number quicker, and much, much more. If you enjoy these types of episodes or have been enjoying the podcast in general, please leave a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. It really helps other Canadians discover the podcast, and it helps me with bringing on top-notch guests for you so that we can all learn from them. Apple Podcasts makes it really easy to leave a rating, but if you're using Spotify, you have to click on the show within your Spotify app and then scroll to the very top to leave a star rating. It's right below the show description, and it literally takes seconds and really helps support the show. So thank you in advance for doing that. And now let's get into the interview. All right, Jordan, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to be here today. Awesome. So for anybody that is hearing you speak for the first time, can you take us through your financial independence story, the path you took to get there, how things actually changed for you once you hit your financial independence number and what you're doing right now. So financial independence was something that I thought nothing about. It was almost an accident for me. I grew up wanting to be a doctor. My father was a doctor. He died when he was 40 and I was seven years old. And I wanted to walk in his footsteps. I never thought a thing about money, wasn't worried about finances. Part of that is because I grew up in a privileged middle-class family, but my goal was to become a doctor. And that's what I pursued. In the meantime, I was lucky enough that my parents had modeled great financial behavior. So they always saved at least half of their income. They invested in real estate. They side hustled. All of these great financial lessons they taught me without specifically saying them, but I grew up watching them do these things. I indeed, I indeed did become a physician and found that as opposed to it being joyous, I got burned out really, really quickly. And at some point, I realized I can't do this for the rest of my life. I had been practicing medicine for about 15 years, and I was burning out and getting exhausted and started to look at ways that I could leave the medical field. And I started asking myself the question, how much money do I really need not to work again? That took me to my accountant and financial advisor that gave me vague answers that I wasn't particularly happy with. Eventually, in 2014, this guy named Jim Daly, the white coat investor, had a book that he just wrote about personal finance for high net worth individuals. He sent it to me to review because I had a medical blog at the time. I read his book. It changed my life. It introduced me to the idea of financial independence. That sent me down the rabbit hole, and I knew immediately that I was financially independent. I actually, from all that great modeling from my parents, I had enough money. I could do what I want. Strangely enough, as opposed to being excited, which I was for a moment or two, I had a panic attack. And I realized that I had spent so much time worrying about getting out of medicine and then figuring out the money surrounding getting out of medicine that I had no idea who I wanted to be, what I wanted to do with my life. And I had this connection to my father that was the last wisp of a connection from all those years ago that he died. And I had to come to terms with this idea that I was going to leave medicine, something that still connected me to him. So all of that was really, really difficult. And it took me years from that point on to start trying to figure out what is my true purpose and identity? How do I start to pursue them? And how do I pull away from specifically the parts of medicine that weren't serving me anymore? Interestingly enough, I did find that one part was serving me, which was taking care of the terminally ill and dying or doing hospice work. 
And also exciting is that I found that hospice work started informing my work in personal finance. I had started writing a personal finance blog and doing a personal finance podcast, Earn and Invest. And I found the perspective of my dying patients could actually add to those financial conversations. And that was a revelation. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And when you were on your way to financial independence, what is the process that you did to figure out whether you actually had enough to retire? So after reading The White Coat Investor, I did some basic calculations. And, you know, I think 25 times your yearly spending is not perfect, but at least at that point, you have a vague idea of what enough looks like. And I had never even paid attention to how much I spent each year. I just knew that I put a lot away, but I had never been careful about looking at the numbers. So once I figured that out, I multiplied 25 times my yearly spending. I'm like, oh, that is kind of a vagary of a financial independence number. And then I can start looking at my life and getting more specific. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was that kind of first calculation that I did or the safe 4% safe withdrawal rate, right? Taking your net worth, multiplying it by 0.04, and then coming up with, with how much that portfolio will afford you every year and seeing if that will fit your needs. But that, those were the kind of like those basic first calculations. Yeah. What I often think about when people ask me for advice around this particular subject is what's a good process to take? Because you don't want to just take the 4% rule sort of blindly and just follow that to the letter and just ignore everything else. Because there's all these different things and all these different variables and also so many levers that you can pull that will could actually potentially let you even leave your job many years earlier. And I mean, you talk a lot in your book about how you want to find some sort of meaningful work they actually enjoy that you would be even willing to do for free. But hey, it actually tends to generate money as well, which can help you. So I find as a kind of warning, right, it's because people get really excited about the 4% rule. And I find it's a very inspirational thing as well, especially for someone that hates their job or they're getting burnt out. But it's like, there's other things you need to do as well. So do you have a particular maybe net worth number in mind that you think is useful where someone's like, okay, I'm getting pretty close to the 4% rule. I'm not there yet, but maybe if I pull certain levers, I can actually quit my job now. Like, So one example would be, okay, if I'm willing to work, let's say part-time or you know, 10 hours a week doing a side hustle that I actually enjoy, maybe then I don't need 4%. I need less than that. Do you have any advice around that? Well, I do. And this is actually some of the push of the book. See, I think our problem is we start with the financials and then work our way back to what we right. want to do. Yeah. I think we have to actually do it differently. I think we have to start thinking about purpose, identity, and connections first. If that's forefront in our mind, then the decisions about work and making money become easier because it's not really a question of if I hit this percentage, I can stop working or I can leave my job. It's more like, okay, this is what's purposeful in my life. What are some of the things I can change to live a more purposeful life? So that might mean that I go from working 100% of my you know, normal workday, let's say it's the nine to five, and I cut my workday 50%. By doing that, I might not be able to retire for 10 or 15 years later. But that other 50% of the time that I've just gained, I'm going to do something really purposeful with it. Now, that purposeful thing may generate revenue which means you can either then pull away from the parts of the nine to five you don't like or retire early, or it may not. And it just means, again, that you've started to go after purpose sooner than waiting until that retirement someday. And so I think we really have to stop looking at those numbers and more look at this idea of what do we want to do with ourselves? Because the whole point of financial independence actually is not net worth. The whole point of financial independence is to live a life full of purpose and meaning, so you can slow down that progress towards financial independence, quote unquote, if you can start bringing that purpose and meaning in sooner. And so that's why I get caught up with numbers too, because the truth of the matter is, I think the numbers limit our belief about our own opportunities. And that if we can let go of the numbers a little bit and start thinking more about what we want to do with ourselves, um, all sorts of opportunities open up. Right, right. Yeah. So it's not like, oh, I have to hit a million because I think I spend roughly 40K a year. Well, you know, it's like the traditional example, you, a typical example used with the 4% rule. And then, okay, well, I'm not even, because I think some people maybe get discouraged where they look at that. Maybe they're just getting started. Maybe they have a small amount in their investment portfolio. And it's like this $1 million seems impossible. 
and they've sort of quit even before they started, right? And be, because it's sort of demotivating, I imagine, for some. Whereas I, I like your approach where it's like, well, hold on, what if you actually structured your life in a way where it's not all about hitting that 1 million or whatever that number is in the quickest possible time, there's other things to consider. What if you actually structured your life so it's enjoyable now uh, instead, right? While it's still moving towards that. So yeah. Um, yeah, very, very interesting. And if you're being thoughtful with your money, believe it or not, wealth is built while you're busy doing other things. So if you're thoughtful about your money and you can put some away in the stock market or into real estate or what have you, that money compounds and builds. So a lot of people get towards financial independence way faster than they thought. The key, again, is to have that good life, to live that life you want to live now and let the money compounding and the wealth building happen kind of behind the scenes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, for sure. And then now that you have hit your financial independence number, what is the process that you do or calculations that you do now to ensure that you're withdrawing a sustainable amount? So, you know, things like, again, 4% rule we already brought up. Some people use like a variable percentage withdraw, spending floors and ceilings, you know, things of that nature. Is there anything that you sort of found works well for you that you gravitate towards? Well, believe it or not, I've had the luxury of not even worrying about that because when I did finally decide to really cut back on medicine, the part that I still liked doing, the hospice work, the part that I do even if I wasn't getting paid for, I happen to get paid for it. And so I spend about 15 hours a week at most doing hospice work, but it pays me you know, a pretty nice salary. And that money funny enough, allows me generally not to withdraw. Now, my wife also has been in this crux where she's not ready to retire yet, even though we have plenty of money, but she still identifies a sense of purpose with going to work. So at this point, we haven't really had to worry about drawing down because the truth of the matter is we generate revenue either way. But I think those things you were talking about are important. I mean, I think recalculating every year, looking at what you spent, looking at how your safe withdrawal rate is serving you Probably, I think all of us should try some passion side hustles or some passion jobs. If they happen to generate revenue, it just gives us more fuel to go live and do what we want to do. If they don't, then again, we're living more of a purposeful life. But as you were saying, you know, there are all these levers we can toggle if we find that the money is starting to run low. I'm not saying that we should all stop working when we're far away from having that 25 times or 4% save withdrawal rate. I'm just saying that it's exactly that. If you're going to focus on a number, the stock market's going to change tomorrow and you may or may not even get to that number yet. So it's way more important to just focus on life and realize that you can pivot. And especially if you've been building your sense of purpose and identity together, you can pivot to doing something that's purposeful for you that where you make a little money in case things go in a direction you don't want them to go. And then you mentioned how uh, doing the hospice work. I remember there was a, the one famous book as well, the I believe it was called like Regrets of the Dying, if I remember yeah, correctly. Yeah, Brownie right? Five Regrets of the Dying. Yeah, and then so it was. It's interesting because I mean you've had I guess a similar experience, right? Because you 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 also work sort of in that capacity. Can you tell us some of the key lessons or commonalities that you find or that you found as you've worked with patients? Things that us people that aren't in that situation should probably know to help us live a more fulfilling and happy life now, instead of, like you said in your book, instead of waiting until we have that really catastrophic moment and then, okay, now let's do the life evaluation. Like, hold on, well, what if we did it earlier and lived a meaningful life the entire time instead? Yeah, the funny thing about it is that the five regrets of the dying, believe it or not, are also the regrets of the living. We just talk about them when people are dying because it becomes crystal clear. My goal is to take those lessons and make them crystal clear way before we get a terminal diagnosis. So generally, it's not money that people regret, right? They don't regret that they didn't spend more nights and weekends in the office. They don't regret that they didn't hit a certain net worth goal. They regret that they didn't have the energy, courage, or time to do things that were deeply meaningful to them, right? They realized that they didn't even put in the effort to thinking about what was deeply meaningful to them until they found out they didn't have enough time, which is what often happens when people become terminally ill. So what are those things that you want to make sure you do before you die? Who are those people you want to reconcile with or make sure they know that you love them? What are those hobbies? What are those things you want to learn? I mean, every person, it's different, but we have these certain life goals that we tend to put off because it's difficult and it's scary. We're afraid we're going to fail, or we, maybe we think it's way too aspirational. Um, the key is to start thinking about those things now. No one regrets failing. Like a lot of people are worried that if they try to do this big thing in their lives that they're anxious about, 
And they're like, I may fail, so I don't want to try. On their deathbeds, no one regrets trying and failing. It's They regret that they didn't try. And that's what I've kind of really tried to get to people is it takes courage to start trying to truly think about your sense of purpose and identity and to act on them and to start living a life that's true to them. And it's courage that's well worth it. I can tell you that from dealing with the dying over and over again, it's well worth putting in the time and effort and even heartbreak now to start thinking about these things. Mm -hmm. And kind of going back to the financial side, are there any tools or calculators that you like to use that you found helpful that some of the listeners can maybe use you know, when it comes to figuring out their financial independence number or their sustainable draw rate from their portfolio? Yeah, I mean, there are tons and tons of calculators out there. I like new retirement. So new retirement, I think it's is it .com or .org. New retirement has a bunch of great calculators, but there, there are really a lot of good ones out there. And, you know, it's funny you ask that. I used to spend a lot of time doing that, you know, 10 years ago when I discovered this stuff. Something funny happens. At some point, you stop caring about that stuff. You really do. Like, I don't care. I don't look at my net worth that often. I don't look at my investments that often except to make sure that they're generally in the right place. For the first year after I discovered financial independence, I messed around with those yeah. calculators endlessly. Me as well, yeah. <laughs> I almost never do now. I can't tell you the last time I messed around with one of those calculators. It's because you start realizing that that isn't the point, right? Because again, the day changes, the stock market goes up or down and your net worth number is now different and the set of calculations changes, right? So you can't even control all those variables that you're using constantly are changing, it becomes an exercise in futility. Again, it's fun in the beginning. And I think a lot of people do get a sense of joy out of working the numbers in the beginning. But at some point, you move on. And I think a lot of people, once they start getting the general gist of it, will stop looking at those calculators and start thinking more about how can I build a better life today mm -hmm. as well as for tomorrow. Yeah. I found them to be a good anxiety reliever once you are approaching fire, or like even after you hit it, just because you're not used to being retired. And so you kind of, I remember like crunching and recrunching the numbers just to make sure I didn't make a mistake and trying other different tools and, and it kind of helps. But like you said, eventually you're sort of like, okay, there's only so many times I can press the recalculate button where it's like, this is getting a little redundant now. And again, doing that does not solve really the primary challenge of retirement and you know where you're trying to figure out, okay, well, what are you going to do with your time now? How do you have a meaningful life and all that, right? Like those are really important questions that yeah. You then yeah. you, you have to t tackle them eventually, right? Yep. Another easy one I forgot to mention is Fire Calc. Oh yes, yeah. F I R E C A L C. That's a pretty easy, good one, simple, free, a certain reasonable number of variables. But for sure. but again, yeah, kind of as we said. Yeah, I remember using that that one as well. Yeah, yeah. For a lot of the listeners of the show, they're in Canada, and so those are at least Fire Calc. I know it is an American one, but you are able to tweak the different variables to sort of make it apply a little bit to you in Canada or to make it still kind of apply. But realistically, just for everyone listening, that's sort of in that Canadian camp. Once you get close to that, you really should be meeting with a fee-for-service financial planner anyway at that point, just because like we already talked about, there's all these levers that you can pull. And so you don't want to base all your decisions on an online calculator you found, even though they're incredible. You know, some of them are really, really good. You know, you want things that are more custom to your specific scenario because you may be able to actually retire years earlier than you think, potentially, right? Like what Jordan was saying, depending on what you choose to do, right? Maybe you do like a side hustle thing that you love doing that actually pays and now you can actually retire earlier. So, or leave that job you don't like earlier. So yeah, I just want to mention that just for all the Canadians, because that's the challenge we have here in Canada, right? Is we have these really good tools in the US and so then how do we apply them as Canadians? We need a good process. And now a quick message from one of our sponsors. No one has a business like yours with all its strengths and challenges. This small business month, you need a hiring partner that adapts to your needs. You need Indeed. With Indeed, you don't spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills when you can do it with just Indeed. You can also find top talent fast with Indeed's suite of powerful hiring tools like Indeed Instant Match, Assessments, and Virtual Interviews. One thing that I love about Indeed is that it makes hiring all in one place easy because it does the hard work for you. 
Sponsor a job and boom, Instant Match shows you candidates whose resumes on Indeed fit your description immediately after you post. With Instant Match, you can start hiring fast. And according to Talent Nest 2019, Indeed delivers eight times more hires in Canada than all other job sites combined. So start hiring now with a $100 sponsored job credit to sponsor your job post at Indeed dot com slash build wealth. The offer is good for a limited time. Again, you can claim your $100 credit now at indeed.com slash build wealth. Terms and conditions apply. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. And now back to the show. So moving on, for those that are still working towards reaching their financial independence number, are there any specific tips that you can give them that had a substantial impact on your own life that helped you get to your financial independence number quicker? I mean, I think it's the obvious stuff, right? So it's not spending on things uselessly, like needlessly, as well as seeing if there are side hustle, side projects, things that can really beef up your income, right? Because really the amount of money we can make is unlimited. One thing I found as a physician is that seeing patients in the office was really hard, but because I had a certain knowledge set from doing what I did, I could become a medical director of nursing homes, home health companies, things like that, where my time was much less, but I was receiving monthly stipends. So interestingly enough, I found that what I call lazy side hustles, they're not lazy because they don't take work. They're lazy because you already have the skills and knowledge from your primary job in order to take on extra responsibilities that make you extra money. Lazy side hustles are a great way to really increase your income. And there's no cost to them because there's usually very little extra education needed or you can pick it up on the job. So as a doctor, someone highly trained who did lots of years of schooling and had lots of experience, I found that it was easy to fall into these directorships and these things that were willing to pay me decently for very little of my time. Mm -hmm. That's such a great tip because I think some people, you know, there's so much stuff online about, oh, starting your own side business and where you're pretty much starting from scratch. You're a doctor. Oh, are you going to go and start some e-commerce company because you saw a really good course online that teaches you how to do that? And okay, that may work for some, but it's not like you have to start from scratch. You've already done all the schooling and experience you know, it seems like a way you can fast track things a lot better instead of just like, okay, let's just put all that training on the back burner and do something from the very beginning, right? Yeah. Here's an added benefit. When I started doing these medical side hustles, one of them for me was hospice work because I joined a group and started helping them as a director. And that became my passion. So I started a side hustle on something I was vaguely interested mm-hmm. in. It increased my bottom line every month while I was trying to get to financial independence quicker. And it eventually became the thing that I wanted to spend my time doing regardless. So it really ended up being something very passionate and part of how I really identify myself today. And that started as a side hustle. That's incredible. Yeah. So not only using that as a efficient way to make more money to hit your fine number quicker, but also using something like that. I mean, it could actually become a thing of self-discovery where you figure out your your troop, which is fantastic. Yeah. And then because a lot of these, like I spoke at my... The high school I went to a few months ago, which was wonderful, but then trying to give advice to these teenagers and it's, you know, how do you figure out your passion, right? When you're at that that age, some people have it figured out from like, they they know they want to be a doctor from grade five. Most people I think don't really know yet, especially when they're that young, yet we're forced to decide, okay, what major am I going to do that kind of a thing? So to your point, how even as an adult, so much of this is you just, you try it because you might like it and then you might hate it, you might like it, but you might find that sort of golden nugget where you're like, wow, I love this and it's fulfilling and it pays money and it doesn't feel like work. And I mean, that's like the gold mine, I think, right? Like the sort of on a Venn diagram where it checks all the boxes. So that's fantastic. I really like that. That sounds like such a really good approach. Here's a good pro tip for side hustles. No one really says you have to be passionate about your nine to five or your what we call a W-2 in the US, right? No one says you have to be passionate about that. But if you're going to take on a side hustle, it should be one of two things. It should either be really easy, quick money, or it should be something you're passionate about. We're talking about side hustles here. Easy money or something you're passionate about. If you only do those kind of side hustles, you're going to win, right? Because in the first case, you're going to make money and probably not spend a lot of time doing it. In the second case, you might not make a huge amount of money, but it's going to be something that helps you fulfill that sense of purpose and identity. And if you happen to make money, then you've really hit the jackpot because you can start doing more of that and not only making money, but living that more purposeful life. 
Yeah, I remember hearing an example from you. It was either one of the interviews I've heard you do with other podcasters, or it might have been in your book where where you take that approach where maybe that side hustle that you enjoy starts making money. And now you're able to, let's say, cut your hours at your primary nine to five. So now you're just, you turn that into a part-time, you know, 20 hour a week instead of a 40 hour a week thing. And for the other 20 hours, you're working on your side hustle. And now you're pumping so much more time into the side hustle you actually enjoy that that's now going to grow way quicker than, than, you know, when you were just working on a days, you know, evenings and weekends. And then eventually that can surpass your nine to five where now you're doing your, you know, your side hustle full time now, but it's actually something you enjoy doing. Uh, so I thought, you know, that was a big light bulb moment, I think for, for me. And I think for a lot of people where that, that sounds like a really good path instead of just grinding it out in a job you dislike that you're getting burned out from you know, waiting to hit that $1 million or whatever it is that your target is, right? Yeah. I want to be real specific about this because listen, I come from a place of privilege. When I decided that I was done working, I looked at my finances and I was pretty close to financial independence. Not everyone comes at it with this kind of privilege. So the point being is this idea that you can start subtracting out of your life things you don't like from work and have a better life and be more purposeful. That's easy for someone who's financially independent. But a lot of people say, hey, I'm young. I'm just barely paying my bills. How am I going to subtract out of this job that I don't like now? And that's why I think it's being really specific about this idea of especially young people using other tools besides money, right? We have the tool of money, but we also have the tool of energy, our passions, our connections, our community. Start using some of those other tools to develop these passion side hustles and things like that. So that you do have some leverage, even when you're just barely paying your bills. Because a lot of people come up to me and they say, yeah, it sounds great for you, this doctor who makes a lot of money and you're financially independent. But I'm 22. I just got out of college. I have a subpar job that's paying me just enough to put money on the, you know, to put dinner on the table every night. And they're like, there's no way possible I could start thinking about purpose now. And my goal is to start getting those people to really think about purpose too, and then building in things like passionate side hustles that not only are a good use of their time, utilize the abundance of energy they have because they're in their 20s, but also eventually might start creating that tool of money too, so that they can get out of those nine to fives and eight to sixes that they don't like. And then once you hit your financial independence number, what were some of the mistakes you made that you think could have been avoided knowing what you know now? Yeah. The big mistake is I waited until I got to my financial independence number to figure out who I was or what I wanted to do with myself. Right. And then the next thing I almost did, which I didn't make a mistake is I almost just quit medicine and walked away, which would have been a huge mistake because I had no sense of what purpose or identity meant. So instead I did what I think people should do, especially if they're not sure where to go next is to start tearing down their career, getting rid of those points of friction, using the art of subtract and to subtract out the clients you don't like or the hours you don't like or the certain tasks within your job. Now that you're financially independent, you have a little bit more control. You can start getting rid of those things that you don't like and look at your job and see, is there anything that you do like? Is there anything in your job left that still has a sense of purpose and identity? Because you want to hold on to those things get rid of everything else. And then that extra space and time you've created, you can use to pursue other passionate, purposeful things. And so I think that was a big problem that it could have been for me and is for people a lot is they just up and quit their job and then they have no idea what to do with themselves. And I really think it should be a much more gradual process of figuring out who you are and what you want to do with your time. And like I said, kind of subtracting out the worst parts of your job first and see if there's anything worth hanging on to. Yeah, that was a life-changing thing when I read your book was kind of what you what you just said there of looking at it things from that angle, especially once you hit phi. Because uh, I think in your case, if I remember correctly, you had your own practice and then that was a lot of time and it included everything that's involved in having your own business essentially, right? And then I think then you switched to being basically on contract, but for someone else. And so you got rid of so much of the things you hated and now it, it removed a lot of this headache and now you're focusing more on what you want. And then you kept tweaking it, I guess, right? So eventually you were only doing the things you actually enjoyed. Did I recollect that correctly? Yeah, it was a refining process. So I started, I got rid of my own practice first. And then I was just seeing patients in the nursing home and doing hospice work and a few other things. But then the nursing home was stressing me out because I was getting calls in the middle of the night. So I got rid of that. Then I was working more full-time for hospice, but I didn't want to work nights and weekends. So I just stopped doing nights and weekends. Eventually I ended up a contractor with this hospice where I work 10 to 15 hours a week, no nights, no weekends. Most of what I do is actually done on the phone or by text. 
And it's really an easy, good life. I still feel like I have this huge impact on people's lives, but I've gotten rid of all the bad stuff. Mm-hmm. Like all the stuff I didn't want to do is gone. And, and to me, that's perfect. And you know what? This could last for a while, but you know, healthcare changes, businesses change. Maybe the business won't need me anymore. Maybe regulations will change. And then I'll have to pivot again. But for now, this feels like the best, most purposeful use of my time. And by only doing it 10 to 15 hours a week, I have tons of time to write a book or to do a podcast or to do other things that I've now built into my life that really fulfill me and feel like I'm doing what I want to do with myself. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to know yourself this well, where you know exactly what you like, what you don't like. Because I know a thing, a mistake that I've made in the past is I kind of had this expectation like, oh, I'm old enough. I should have all this figured out. I should already know all this about myself and what I like and what I don't like. And then I remember in your book, you mentioned that it actually took you a while to figure all this out and to to make these tweaks that this was not something you figured out in a week. And then you were, you're like, oh, my life is now fully happy and optimized and I'm only doing things I like. How long did it actually oh, take it, you? It took years. I mean, I oh, okay. read Jim Daly's book in 2014 and I mostly left medicine in 2018. In the middle of that, I did a huge dive into the financial independence movement. I started my own blog where I wrote every day, which was almost like an online diary where I was hashing out how I felt about these issues. And then eventually in 2018, I was like, okay, I'm out. Like, I'm just going to do this little bit that I want. But I had been refining and refining and refining up to that point. Mm -hmm. None of this stuff is easy. And there, you know... Part of the reason I wrote this book was because there was no other book to help me figure this part out. Like, I always say figuring out the money is easy. And when I say easy, that doesn't mean it isn't incredibly hard work. It doesn't mean that everyone's going to get there. But it's easy to know how, right? You get this idea of, I need to make more money. I might need to side hustle. I need to spend less I can calculate what looks like a financial independence number and tweak it accordingly. I can use math and science. But trying to figure out how to actually use this tool, this superpower to live a good life, and then furthermore, learn how to live the good life in the process of getting to that superpower, as opposed Mm. to waiting until you get there. You know, that was something people don't really talk about much. And so that's why I felt so passionate about using this experience I got from the dying to really try to put this down on paper so it would make sense. So people could say, ah, this is how I go about being purposeful. This is how I go about figuring out what to do with financial independence. Because I feel like we've done this lousy job of really defining what financial independence is really for, because it's not about money. It's not about bank accounts. It's not even about not working again. It's about taking our limited resource, which is time, and filling that time with the most meaningful and purposeful activities. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the idea behind this book is how can I help people get there faster and start filling those time slots with more meaningful things? Because we only get a certain number of time slots. Everyone's slightly different, but time passes no matter what we do. And and so that, that was really my thought process. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And I'm glad you said that expectation of, Hey, this can take you years to figure out because I think at least in my case, you know, when we hit our number, I thought I should have already had it figured out or, Oh, I'll figure it out in a few months and I will be eternally happy. Right? And then the reality is no, because like you have to self-discover, you try different things, especially when you're working full-time, right? It's hard to try all these other things, right? Cause you're busy with other things or kids and that kind of a thing. So I remember that was kind of a life-changing thing for me when I read your book was take it easy on yourself. Don't, expect this overnight thing or some light bubble goes off and you know exactly what you like and what you don't like and how to tweak. It's a continuous thing. And then I guess things too is once you get older and you have experience, they change over time, I imagine a little bit as well. And so you have to be open to that and do like self-evaluation and self-reflection to figure that out. Would you say that's true? It is. And there's no easy button. If there was an easy button, we'd all do this and this book would be obsolete. There really is no easy button. It's going to take you time and energy to work through this. It's going to be no fun sitting down and doing some of these purpose activities, thinking about what it's like to feel like you're on your deathbed and trying to define what you would be regretful that you didn't do. This is hard work. It makes you think about your mortality. You have to come face to face with the fact that our time on this earth is limited. It's uncomfortable. And so if there was an easy button, I would hand it to you and say, just push that button and you'll be there. But it isn't. It's going to take you years. It's going to take thought. It's going to take pivoting. And even at this point in life where I feel fairly settled and I feel like I'm living the life exactly what I want to do, that could change in a year or two. I I may have to reevaluate. 
I mean, that's the nature of life yeah. is it changes and, and that's okay. I mean, that can also be the flavor and spice of life too. And so that's, it's both exciting and scary at the same time, but we've got to be willing to do the work on some level. Mm, for sure. Yeah, and I really like in your book, how you, at the end of the chapters, you have an actual actionable list of things to do to help you figure all these things out uh, yourself, which I thought was fantastic, right? Because we're talking about these things which are somewhat philosophical in nature. And then it's like, okay, so I get it. I'm sold. It's important. I get, I agree. We got to figure this out. But then how do you, you know, what's the next action that I can do to actually do this? And in your book, you, you have that. So multiple times, right? Like on different chapters, you have different parts you're trying to work through. So it's sort of like a workbook as well, in, but in, in a very, very good way because it's practical. And so that's great. Uh, maybe yeah, you mentioned your book. Can you maybe tell us a little bit more about where we can get it? I believe it, uh, it's an audio format as well for those that prefer listening. Yeah, just, just tell us more where we can get it. And like I said, it's fantastic. I, I To me, it's one of my like sort of like life-changing books. It's on that list for me. It's, it's fantastic. First and foremost, thank you so much for saying that. It really was a work of passion, and it really is a synopsis of kind of all the things I've learned all these years. I've been writing about medicine since 2005. I've been writing about personal finance and podcasting, and it just was a chance for me to bring everything together in a coherent story that I think hopefully will help people. The name of the book is Taking Stock, A Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, Building Wealth, and Living a Regret-Free Life. You can find it wherever you can find books online, Amazon, Books A Million, Target, et cetera. The easiest way to find me and therefore links to the book is if you just go to my personal website, jordangrummet.com. That's J-O-R-D-A-N-G-R-U-M-E-T.com. You'll see links to the book. You'll see links to my medical blog, my personal finance blog, as well as my personal finance podcast. The place I most interact with people is on the Earn and Invest podcast, and that's earnandinvest.com. Awesome. Yeah. And for, again, we have a lot of Canadians that listen to this podcast. And I will say that Jordan is from the US, but the book is very, very, very much so applicable to Canadians because you know, we're not talking about, you should put this in your Roth IRA account and you're like, oh, what is that? I'm in Canada. That doesn't apply to me. That, he doesn't talk about that piece. He talks about, I would say, the more critical philosophical things that you really, you're going to have to figure this out anyway, eventually for yourself just to be happy and fulfilled You know, when you hit your fine number. And so he helps you get there no matter really which country you are in because these are more like human things that we need for self-actualization, fulfillment, happiness, as opposed to, hey, what is the latest tactic to save you know, a few basis points on this ETF? That he, he doesn't really go into that. Wonderful book. And then, yeah, thanks for letting us know about where we can get it. Thank you for having me on. It's been a great conversation. And uh, I'm just excited to get the book out there and have hopefully it help people. No problem. So one of the fascinating things that I recall hearing from you when you were being interviewed by Paula Pant is that you actually went through a depression once you hit financial independence. And I think this sounds very surprising to most as the sort of underlying assumption that I think most people have of financial independence is that once you reach it, you basically quit your job and you have all the time and money you need to focus on being consistently happy. What triggered that depression in your case? And what can we all learn from that experience so that we don't fall into that same trap? So I had built up financial independence and financial stability as such an important factor in my life. It clouded everything else. It became the sole focus. And when I got there and realized, in a sense, there was no there there, it was a mirage. It was a number on the paper that A, could change from day to day, and B, didn't really solve any problems except my most basic money problems. I had been so excited to get there. I thought that was what was going to solve everything. And when it didn't, when it didn't tell me who I want to be or what's purposeful in my life or how I should spend my time, I got depressed. And I think this happens to a lot of people. I think you get to this point where you build it up as this really important thing and then realize what you thought was the answer wasn't the answer. It's one of many tools but that was when the hard work needed to begin because I didn't do the hard work before. What I want all the people reading my book is to actually start doing the hard work from day one. I didn't. And so it was a real depressing moment. Uh, it's like, imagine you are climbing to the top of the highest peak, the highest mountain, and you're about to get there and declare to the world that you've reached the highest peak and you get up past those last few steps 
stand tall and look up and realize that you are on the bottom floor of what ends up being an even higher mountain. Mm -hmm. And there's just this daunting moment where you realize I was going after the wrong thing. And what I thought were the heights weren't the heights at all. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, or, oh, I, oops, I climbed the wrong mountain. Because yeah. I, yeah. Because I, I lived a life thinking it was this way. And, you know, if, if only I did some more of this self reflection, like you pointed out in your book and self discovery, I mean, that's kind of how you want to. It's almost like yeah, if you're trying to, if you're lost in a forest and you want to try to figure your way out, well, probably you want to make sure you're going the right way first, right? Because you don't want to spend days yeah. going the wrong direction. Yeah. And you're like, whoops, now I got to backtrack. I mean, I, I could see that being a very big emotional hit for sure. And it's natural. And so I guess my message to you, because I think a lot of people get to this point is, yes, there is hard work to come, but it's doable hard work. And you have this wonderful tool in your pocket now, this extra money, this financial independence. Now that you have the boon of this great tool, use it. Allow that to be the tool that helps you really start looking into what you want out of life. Um, it's a superpower. And so that's exciting. Like it's exciting as opposed to getting depressed the way I did. In retrospect, I should have been really excited because although I was at the beginning of my journey, I was well stocked and had everything I needed. I just had to then do it. Yeah, yeah. You, you had the financial means and the time to, yeah. to figure this out, right? That's true. Now, you know, for me, as somebody that is not in the medical profession, being a doctor seems like one of the most meaningful and fulfilling careers that one could have as you're literally, you know, saving lives or at the very least, vastly improving the lives of others in a significant way when you're working on your craft. Yet you decided to move from that to the field of communication, you know, through your book, through your podcasting, your speaking, you know, writing about matters relating to personal finance. Did you ever feel like you were helping less or not achieving your maximum amount of positive contribution to society by focusing on personal finance, you know, you're helping others in personal finance still, right? But focusing on personal finance instead of like literally saving lives and healing others as a doctor. Well, you know, I have two thoughts when it comes to that. One is my dreams of what being a doctor was, wasn't the reality of what it became. So even when I walked in to the office as a full-fledged physician, I didn't feel like I was helping people nearly in the way I thought I would be, right? That dream of running in you know, giving the specific treatment that's going to save someone's life and poof, voila, they were better and the family congratulating you. All that kind of stuff we dream up as kids is not at all what medicine is like. It's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot of computer work. It's a lot of failing, patients failing, you failing. It's a lot of worries about things like malpractice, something we have a lot of in the United States. And so it didn't live up to the dream of what I would thought it was going to be. The other issue was I had always identified as a communicator. I just didn't know it. Like I was sneaking away from medicine to write a medical blog or to public speak or to do all these things that I called hobbies and was fitting into the small increments of time that I could spare when I wasn't running my busy practice. That was always there. The difficulty was that identity of being a doctor that I was wearing like a cloak on my outsides didn't mean really match the identity of the inside of being a communicator, which is what I truly was. So I felt a lot of shame and embarrassment. Being a doctor never felt good to me. So as I've transitioned to more of a communicator role, I was able to keep a piece of being a doctor, the hospice piece. So I still have that wonderful sense of I can help people, I can change the world, I can be there for people in their time of most medical need. So I'm lucky enough to have a piece of that doctoring that still fulfills that. Mm -hmm. But I also realized that in the personal finance world, you can affect people too. Having these important conversations changes people's lives. And I can't tell you how many times I've been at a conference and someone walked up to me and they said, I heard that podcast episode you did. And it made me think about something I'd never thought about. And my life has changed since. Or someone here heard me speak at another conference and comes up to me and says, you know, I heard that two years ago when I went to this conference you spoke at, and I really changed my life because of it. When people say those kind of things, you realize that we all have the ability to affect the people around us. It's easy to look at professions like doctoring and give them all the credit because they're there, you know, saving people's lives. But the truth of the matter is we all have this innate possibility of touching the people around us. And when we do that, we create ripples that move through the ocean and affect hundreds, if not thousands of other people. The person you help goes on to feel better about life and help someone else and it spreads. So I have a much different feeling about that than I used to. I realize that 
it's an excuse to say you have to have some degree or be in some profession to change people's lives. I think by going about quietly being good human beings and helping the people around us in whatever humble way we can changes the world. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I kind of think about now. Mm, That's wonderful. I get a lot of questions from listeners of the show. If I know of a good organization or person that can help them optimize their finances, do their financial planning, and answer any questions that they may have. I spend a lot of time researching on who I can actually wholeheartedly recommend and use myself when it comes to financial coaching. And as you know, there is a lot of conflict of interest here in Canada where you can easily fall into the trap of going with a financial planner or financial advisor, thinking that they have your best interest at heart, but really they're just trying to persuade you to buy some expensive investment product from them so that they can earn their hefty commission. So the organization that I personally use and recommend for coaching, financial planning, and optimization is called Enriched Academy. They are as legitimate as it gets. They actually coach Canadian police officers and have actually been implemented by the government of Alberta to be in their schools teaching financial literacy. And they're already in over 400 schools and colleges. They don't sell any investment products, so they are totally unbiased, which is a key reason why I decided to take part in their coaching myself, as their advice is 100% geared towards benefiting you, as opposed to trying to earn some commission on the side. So the special page that they set up for Build Wealth Canada listeners to get a free one-on-one live assessment call is over at buildwealthcanada.ca slash enriched. That's buildwealthcanada dot ca slash enriched. Give it a shot. It's free. There's no obligation or anything like that if you try them and don't think it's a good fit. I hope you give it a shot. And now back to the show. In your book too, you talk about focusing on enjoying the journey instead of just the destination by focusing on what you call the climb. Can you explain what the climb is and how can it be applied by those on their way towards financial independence and those that are already there? So I've done a lot of thinking about what happiness, quote unquote, happiness really looks like, and especially in my life. And so I've talked a lot about purpose, identity and connections, doing things that add to the sense of purpose, identity and connections, I think is a big part of it. But we also have to put in perspective this idea of goals. Like I've been an achiever my whole life, whether it was going to medical school or winning awards or having certain positions or making a certain amount of money. I was always going after these achievements. And the problem, a little bit like financial independence, is I would get to that achievement. Instead of being happy, I would feel a little bit bereft and then feel like I'd have to go find the next achievement. And it became a treadmill that didn't feel very good. So what I now think of happiness is much different. And I call it the climb. And what the climb is, is it's getting involved in things that are very purposeful and meaningful for you. But instead of looking at the end goal is the most important thing, I really want to do things or or take climbs where the process brings me joy. And then regardless of the product, whatever that task achieves, regardless if I think that part is a success or failure, it makes me happy or gives me joy to be involved in the process. So let's talk about something that really is meaningful to me. It's podcasting. I love podcasting. It's the thing I really want to spend most of my time doing. I could set a goal of having a million downloads from the Earn and Invest podcast every month. That's a huge goal. But the truth of the matter is I have very little control over whether I achieve that goal or not, right? I can I can try to make a better show. I can promote it better. But ultimately... I may succeed, I may not. If I focus my happiness on that, it's not going to be so great. And let's say I do get to those million downloads a month, guess what's going to happen? Either I'm going to be petrified that I'm going to lose them, or I'm going to start thinking that a million isn't enough and I need two million. Either way, I'm not particularly happy. So when I think of the climb and I put a podcast into that idea, I love doing a podcast because I love doing it. I love the moments in front of the mic where I'm asking those questions and we're having those great conversations. So to me, that's a perfect climb because I love the process. So that's part one. Part two is, although I might never reach that huge goal of a million downloads a month, I want to have climbs in which I feel like I make some incremental gain. So maybe I get 50 more listeners a month. Maybe I have a certain impact or get to a total downloads over a certain time. But the point is, I feel like I'm always improving and getting better. It doesn't have to be huge improvements, but I have to feel like I'm continuously moving up. 
And so I think that's really a big part of what happiness is. It's building a climb or a series of climbs in which you enjoy the process and you feel like you're making some incremental gain regardless of the final outcome. And I think that's what we should be doing with our lives. That's what our money should be doing for us. That's the purpose of financial independence. That's the purpose of all these wonderful tools we have is to create a series of climbs and live our life that way. Mm -hmm. And that to me is happiness. And I remember too, in your book, you mentioned sort of these three, I guess I'll call them pillars where there's purpose, identity, and connection, if memory serves. Can you maybe speak to those briefly as well? Hopefully I'm not spoiling a part of the book that you don't want people hearing until they've read the book. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty straightforward. Purpose, identity, and connections. Purpose is our why. Why do we do what we do? What sense of meaning does it have for us? Identity is who we are. And when you start building a sense of purpose and identity, it naturally leads to connections. So for me, I wasn't sure what my purpose was until I did some of this work. And I realized that my purpose was to create these conversations. What followed from that is my identity is not being a doctor. It's not being a father or an award winner at this or that or the other. My identity is being a communicator. So I'm a communicator whose purpose is to build this climb of having these great conversations and affecting people's lives. When I started coming to terms with that, it naturally led to connections. So I went to medical school, residency. I practiced medicine. For all those years, I had almost no doctor friends. I hated hanging out in the doctor's lounge in the hospital. And when I went to a party with my wife and people were talking about what they did for a living, I felt shame. And the reason why is my purpose and identity were off. And so I didn't like talking about what I was doing because it it didn't really fulfill my needs. When I did start understanding this idea of being a communicator and identifying that way, I started to go to personal finance conferences. And within minutes, I was creating stronger bonds than I had created within years in the medical community. And that's how I kind of knew that the purpose and identity led to these connections. I had finally met my people. And that's what helps you really pursue these climbs in your life. And it keeps happening to me. So by understanding my purpose and identity of becoming a communicator, I developed a lot of connections, including a guy named Grant Sabatier, who read my writing and said, dude, you need to write a book about hospice and personal finance. And when he said that to me, I realized it was something that was incredibly meaningful to me that I hadn't had the courage to do. I always kept on saying, there's too many barriers. I might fail. I shouldn't do this. He gave me the courage, but not only that, but the wherewithal and the know-how because he knew agents. He knew how to write a book proposal. All the people I had met through podcasting, through pursuing my purpose and identity, knew how to get a book published. So I went and with my friends who helped me, I eventually wrote this book, got an agent, found a publisher, published this book. And now I get to talk with this book about people I care about. And it's leading me to these greater, bigger conversations, which have a lot of purpose and identity for me. And it's connecting me to more and more people. So it's really very circular. And so I think when we get in touch with these things, happiness kind of builds its way into your life. And I think if I understood correctly, you you sort of started with the purpose pillar, right? Like that, And then that helped lead you to figuring out your identity. And then both of those led to the connection piece. And I know in your book, you do talk and you have the exercises as well on how to actually find your purpose. Can you maybe give us your like a little brief sort of teaser or, or, you know, any sort of practical uh, tips for someone that's listening and is thinking, okay, well, I don't really, I I think my purpose is this, but I actually don't know, or I have no clue. How can we start that process? Realizing that this is not something you're going to figure out overnight immediately, you know, unless you're one of those like select few where for some (laughs) reason (laughs) you just know you're born to do X, whatever that thing is. So let me give you a few little teasers. In the book, there's a lot more information than this. And in fact, so when we're talking about purpose, there's something called the life review we do with hospice patients. But a real shortcut to that is asking yourself one or two questions when it comes to purpose. And these can really help you start defining that. One question is, if you can imagine yourself on your deathbed bemoaning your life and thinking, I really regret that I never had the energy, courage, or time to... Whatever you fill in that blank with is probably germane to your sense of purpose. So the visualization of being told you have a terminal illness, it allowing you to think very clearly about what you truly want to achieve in whatever time you have left. I think that's a great 
purpose exercise. Another great purpose exercise is to just think about when was the last time you woke up in the middle of the night excited by an idea and you couldn't go back to sleep? Did you pursue it? And what was that idea about? It's those things that wake us up in the middle of the night that really become part of our purpose. So those are two great, simple questions to start thinking about purpose. When it comes to identity, my favorite exercise is to say the statement or ask yourself the question, I am, and then fill in the blank. And you got to do this over and over again. The first time you do it, it's going to be simple, something like your profession. I used to say, I am a doctor. Then I realized that didn't fit me really well. I had to go further. I am a father, a son, a spouse. Okay, these are family relationships. Then maybe you're going to get to achievements. I am a Plutus Award winner for the Earn and Invest podcast. Okay, that's kind of important, but doesn't really say who I am. Eventually, I came up with, I am a writer, a podcaster, a public speaker. It coalesced into, I am a communicator. So being aspirational, saying that statement, I am filling it in, doing it over and over again. If that doesn't work, start asking friends and family. How do you see me? Who do you see me as? You might be surprised by some of their answers. So those are some simple ways to go after purpose and identity. Connections come when you get purpose and identity in line. So I'm not too worried about the connection piece. That will build on purpose and identity if you start doing that work. Gotcha. And then after achieving financial independence, we have all this time to do what we want. And on the one hand, we want to enjoy what we worked so hard to achieve However, if we just live a life of pure relaxation and hedonism, you know that ends up being very unfulfilling, and it's easy to start to feel anxiety and potentially depression because we are not achieving our potential and not living a life where we are working towards something that we find meaningful and fulfilling. Have you figured out a way to achieve balance in this regard where you still get to enjoy the fruits of your labor from achieving financial independence. So you still get to, you know, have some like pure fun things, relaxation, but while also filling your time with challenging activities that bring you joy, fulfillment, and meaning. Yeah. I mean, so rest, relaxation, and travel are really exciting. And a lot of people really enjoy them, but eventually most of us want to dig into the grid of existence. And what I mean by that is most of us want to do a little bit more profound work. So The wonderful thing about getting to financial independence is you have a lot of time and space to structure your life the way you want to, where you have kind of slow time and downtime when you feel like it. And then you can do work and do some of that harder thinking activities at other times. I guess really my goal is why don't we start trying to figure this out again while we're still in the midst of working and before we're financially independent? Because These are really life practices, and we need to start figuring out how to feel joy when we're in our 20s and 30s and 40s before we're financially independent. We need to start figuring out how to toggle between work that just makes us money, baldly, versus things we do that are purposeful and really fulfill us, versus things we do because we need some downtime. I don't think you have to put a line in the sand and say before financial independence and after financial independence and define them differently. I think you, most people, not all, but most people, especially high achievers who go after financial independence, will find it very hard to live a life of leisure. I think whether they mean to or not, they will start going back towards doing some kind of meaningful work because that's who we are as people. How do you deal with any anxiety that comes from opportunity cost? I remember there was a, a uh, yeah. piece in your book on that specifically. So, for example, you know, I get these internal dialogues of, oh, I deserve to relax and have fun as maybe I just finished working on a meaningful project, you know, and I should strive for that whole work-life balance thing and have some fun, you know, but then that also means that I'm not working on another meaningful project, which is a great opportunity, could be lucrative, and it would definitely help a lot of people. So, I mean, how do you personally deal with something like that? Right. So opportunity cost really relies on this idea of compounding, right? So when you take money, let's say, and you spend it on something frivolous or not, you lose the ability for that money to go into an investment compound and be a lot more money in the future. So what I really try to tell people is, well, guess what? Not only money, but other things compound. Your joy compounds, your relationships compound, your experience and your knowledge. Sometimes it's worth spending money to have some joy. Taking a day off, taking your child to the baseball game and having a joyous day will compound. And when you're old, and you're dying, you will think of that day and it will have gained interest and be of way more value than anything that you put in the bank. And so I think we have to remember that knowledge compounds. When you go out and learn something new, you take that knowledge and it builds and it helps you discover and do new things. Relationships compound. When you spend the time 
being with people, the return on investment can be huge in companionship, in love, in support, even in opportunities to make money. All of these things compound. We make a huge mistake when we narrowly define opportunity costs as having to do with money. And I think when we see it in a broader range, we then realize that we need to do these other things too, and that there are huge returns from them. And I think if you can put it under that perspective, you realize that there are different times in our life for different things, and not every single moment of your life can be spent using and making money appropriately. And then in terms of maximizing happiness and fulfillment, is there a routine that you follow during any part of your day that works well for you? Or do you take a more sort of fluid, go with the flow approach where things are more spontaneous? Oh, so for me, happiness looks like a few things. One is it looks like routine. I love routine. I wake up at about 4.45 every morning. I usually get up, I exercise, I stretch, I read for about 34 minutes with a cup of coffee. Like I love routine. So routine actually makes me incredibly happy. Exercise makes me happy. Regardless of what's going on in my life, exercising, and I try to exercise a good hour and a half, two hours a day, reading. Like I build in reading to every single day. I probably read two books a week, maybe more. Some of it's personal finance stuff, but I love just joyful reading things that, you know, have no, I'm not learning anything from other than reading an interesting story. I think meditation's important. And so I try to, I, I've had a long practice of meditation because when I was a little kid, I had bad headaches and I learned biofeedback and something called self meditation, which really helps or, or self just called meditation, which really helps. I think that's important. And the last thing, which I, I tell people, which is kind of funny as I say, Listen to classical music. Anytime I feel myself getting anxious or worrying about things, put on some quiet classical music. And believe it or not, that really calms my soul too. So I think they're having these practices and these habits are a big part of happiness, at least for me. Gotcha. And then as someone that used to be a full-time doctor, I imagine you have a wealth of knowledge when it comes to maximizing one's longevity as well. Can you give us some advice on that? Because I always kind of go back to, well, what's the point of growing this net worth if we're going to die early anyway, because we aren't taking care of ourselves properly? Yeah. Believe it or not, I think it's simple, right? The big things we have zero control over. So genetics is one. You got bad genetics. You got bad genetics. Can't do anything about that. And the other is luck, right? You get into a car accident, someone rams you because they're a drunk driver. You can't really do much about that. So the big two, genetics and luck, we have very little control over. Believe it or not, the rest is pretty straightforward. Like, Don't smoke exercise, eat reasonably healthy, cut down on stress, love people, like be a good human being. If you kind of do those things, wear your seatbelt, right? Like wear your sunscreen, do the really, really basic health stuff as well as happiness stuff. And perfect is the enemy of good here. Do it good enough and then live your life and, and let it go, right? That's one thing I've learned is being a doctor and being in hospice and palliative care you have so little control over some of this that you have to let go of the feeling like you can control it. So do the things that do help you, the basic stuff, and then you know find a way to be at peace with what you can't change. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice in terms of specifically exercise and nutrition? Yeah, I mean, basic stuff. I don't like to get too prescriptive because I'm not being an, a doctor in this role, but you know, basically you should be doing at least 30 minutes to an hour of some cardiovascular exercise a day, most days of the week. I tell people, don't do something you're going to hate. Like it doesn't have to be running a seven minute mile. You can do a nice brisk walk for an hour a day and that's good enough. Right. And when it comes to eating, as opposed to again, getting prescriptive, look, if we could try to limit most of what we eat to things we could identify that probably aren't processed, we're probably going to do better than most people, right? So try to eat things where you understand the ingredients and mostly haven't been processed. And if you can do that, you're going to be healthy from that standpoint. I'd rather not be more prescriptive than that. Sure. I, sure. Think, I think, A, that's not really the role. I'm not, I'm not really playing that doctor role. But the yeah. other thing is, you know, the knowledge changes so often. I think sometimes we just have to look at the common sense stuff. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Yeah, I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. I just figured I got a doctor on the podcast. Yeah. Got to at least ask about the longevity piece, <laughs> especially when we're talking about FI and retirement yeah. and all that. That sounds great. So again, thanks again so much for coming on. Like I said before, the uh, for me personally, I mean, the book really was life changing. It's it's incredible what an impact it has on me personally. I'm a huge fan. Definitely, uh, I'm going to be linking out to it as well for everybody. But just to jot our memory again, you know, tell us again where we can find your book as well as you know all the other educational content that you produce. 
Yeah, the easiest way is to go to jordangrummet.com. That's J-O-R-D-A-N-G-R-U-M-E-T.com. And you'll find links to pretty much all the content I produce as well as the book. Awesome. All right, Jordan. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It's been great. Thank you for having me. This has been a blast. All right. Awesome. Thanks. Take care. Bye. All right. A big thanks to Jordan for coming on. Please leave a rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify if you enjoyed the episode. And lastly, I'd like to give a big thanks to Indeed for sponsoring this episode. No one has a business like yours with all its strengths and challenges. This small business month, you need a hiring partner that adapts to your needs. You need Indeed. With Indeed, you don't spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills when you can do it with just Indeed. You can also find top talent fast with Indeed's suite of powerful hiring tools like Indeed Instant Match, Assessments, and Virtual Interviews. Indeed's hiring platform helps you easily schedule and conduct virtual interviews all in one place. And if you hate waiting, according to Indeed data, candidates you invite to apply through Instant Match are three and a half times more likely to apply to your job than those who only see it in search. One thing that I love about Indeed is that it makes hiring all in one place easy because it does the hard work for you. Sponsor a job and boom, Instant Match shows you candidates whose resumes on Indeed fit your description immediately after you post. With Instant Match, you can start hiring fast. And according to Talent Nest 2019, Indeed delivers eight times more hires in Canada than all other job sites combined. Start hiring now with a $100 sponsored job credit to sponsor your job post at indeed.com slash build wealth. Offer is good for a limited time. Again, you can claim your $100 credit now at indeed.com slash build wealth. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Thanks for listening to the Build Wealth Canada podcast at www.buildwealthcanada.ca. 